So I'd like to talk about Marin. Uh, Marin is a wonderful colleague of ours at Colorado State University, Colorado Forest Restoration Institute. Marin Chambers is a research associate at Colorado Forest Restoration Institute at CSU. She's done botany and forestry research in the Southern Rocky Mountain region in montane, subalpine, and alpine ecosystems. Her primary interests are disturbance and restoration ecology, specifically forest recovery, resilience, and adaptation to relationship to forest management, natural disturbances such as wildfire or insect disease outbreaks, and climate change. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction, Gloria. I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for spending a bit of your time today to learn about some of the research that I've been doing um, over the last couple of years, examining conifer regeneration in both the Southern um, Rockies and the Colorado Front Range. So I just wanna give you kind of a roadmap of where we're gonna go today. Um, first, I wanna give you kind of some background on the increase in fire frequency and severity in dry conifer forests in the Western United States and some of the potential implications re regarding the resiliency of these fires, uh, I'm sorry, these forests to recover following the high severity wildfire. And then I'll um, quickly discuss um, the results of a study that we did here on the Colorado Front Range where we examined post-fire conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas. And then I'll talk about um, the study that we're working on currently, which is examining post-fire tree regeneration in the larger Southern Rockies region. And then I hope that we'll have plenty of time for um, discussion uh, at the end of the hour. So, so many of you, particularly um, those who work and live here in the Western United States, know that wildfire has long been known to be an important and complex ecological process in Western United States dry um, conifer ecosystems. But in recent decades, wildfires have increased in their size, frequency, and severity. And while this trend is occurring in many forest types across the Western US, ponderosa pine forests are a dry conifer forest type that seems to be particularly impacted. And this trend of more frequent fires and severe fire effects is thought to be the result of increased forest density and homogeneity due to fire suppression, um, livestock grazing and logging activities since European settlement. And so you can see illustrated in this photo of a Colorado front range forest um, that forest densities have increased dramatically in the last hundred years or so, um, leading to high fuel loadings and contiguous forest canopies. Oh, just one moment, please, I apologize. Um, conditions that are ripe for large crown fires, which can um, create very large contiguous patches of complete standard placing burns where few existing seed sources survive. And the historical fire pattern in Ponderosa pine dominated forests did include high severity burn patches. And while there's not complete consensus from the scientific community about this at this time, it's generally thought that modern wildfire patches, um, I'm sorry, current high severity patches within modern wildfire perimeters are orders of magnitude larger than historical patches. Which leads to concerns regarding the ability of ponderosa pine dominated forests to reestablish within modern wildfire perimeters where high severity patches may differ from historical ones under potentially changing fire regimes. And this concern stems from the fact that ponderosa pine is a non serotonous non-sprouting conifer, and its seeds are short-lived in the seed bank. So post-fire regeneration of ponderosa pine depends on seed production and dispersal from surviving trees, which is episodic and relies on specific climatic conditions. And additionally, ponderosa pine seeds are relatively large, and while some long-distance dispersal events do occur, um, it's generally thought that most seeds fall near parent trees in seed shadows, which would make dispersal into these high severity burn areas really challenging. And then of course, other site factors are also likely influencing ponderosa pine regeneration, such as competition with understory vegetation um, or um, the opportunity to germinate on particularly, particularly xeric sites, such as though it, those at lower elevations or on south-facing slopes, may create really harsh conditions for seedling germination and establishment within these high severity burn areas. So 
So after spending a few years as a botany technician working in a high severity wildfire here in Colorado, I became more curious about whether or not these areas would regenerate um, as a forest into the future. And so I had the fortune to examine conifer regeneration following high severity wildfire in the Colorado Front Range for my graduate research as a master's student. And so in recent decades, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of wildfires in ponderosa pine dominated forests in the Colorado Front Range. So the map to your left illustrates um, the, the recent fire history of the Front Range of Colorado. So the approximate distribution is, um, is uh, depicted in green. Um, the approximate distribution of ponderosa pine is depicted in green and fires that occurred prior to 1996 are depicted in yellow and fires that occurred after 1996 are shown in red. And so um, 1996 was an important year as it marked the year of the Buffalo Creek Fire, which if you guys can see my mouse is this long cigar shaped fire here. Um, this fire was much larger than fires previously seen in this region and um, marked the beginning of a trend towards fires that were greater than about a thousand hectares in size and had larger proportions of high severity burn areas than were thought to have historically occurred in this region. So our research aimed to address some of the patterns of conifer regeneration within high severity burn areas on the Colorado Front Range. And so we were specifically interested in learning whether or not conifers were even regenerating in high severity burn areas. Um, and in comparison to areas that burned at a lower or moderate severity, um, and then also areas that um, did not actually burn. We were also interested to understand whether or not distance from um, surviving trees influenced regeneration within high severity burn areas. And we wanted to understand if there were other abiotic or biotic factors that influence kind of regeneration within these severely burned areas. So I collected data in five fires that burned in the montane zone in the Front Range of Colorado, including the um, 2002 Hayman fire, which is this um, very large heart-shaped fire here, um, which is Colorado's largest known wildfire. So all of the fires um, that we sampled needed to be 10 years old or older to allow regeneration events to occur. And the fires were all required to be over a thousand hectares in size and have very large contiguous areas of high severity um, burn patches within the fires. And so I collected data along transects that I established along the edge of a low to moderate severity burn area and a high severity burn area. So this um, image is just an aerial image of what this kind of transect would look like. So we established transects that originated within the low to moderate severity burn area where there were surviving trees, and then extended this transect out into the high severity burn area up to 250 meters from the surviving forest. And when placing this transect within the high severity burn patch, we took great care to ensure that the distance um, along the transect equaled to or was greater than um, any distance to another surviving tree within these high severity burn patches. Um, and then at each 25 or 50 meter increment along the transect, we established a 100 square meter circular plot where we collected data on all live tree seedlings that were greater than five centimeters tall, as well as several abiotic and biotic microsite variables. And we also collected data in approximately 20 control plots that were located outside of the fire perimeters, but were as close to our transect areas as possible. So um, our results um, for the first question uh, regarding whether or not conifers were regenerating in high severity burn areas. Um, if you look at this table, you can see that um, we found that conifers are regenerating within high severity burn areas but that they are um, regenerating at low densities in comparison to the low to moderate and unburned plots that we sampled. And so these higher densities of regenerating conifers in low to moderate severity burn areas and unburned areas suggest that regeneration events have occurred in the 10 or more years since these fires have burned, but severely burned areas are not experiencing similar rates of post-fire conifer regeneration during this time period. And just to give you kind of an understanding of what the conifer species that we um, uh, sampled were, was um, ponderosa pine, which was our dominant species um, and accounted for the vast majority of the conifer um, regeneration that we sampled, 
as well as Douglas fir, um, Rocky Mountain juniper, and lodgepole pine, um, and one blue spruce seedling in the entire study. Um, and the, the amount of regeneration that we were seeing in unburned areas was nearly eight to nine times the amount of regeneration we were seeing in high um, severity burn areas. And in low to moderate severity burn areas, we were seeing nearly five times the amount um, of regeneration that we were seeing in high severity burn areas. Um, um, just, just one moment. Uh, could you leave that outside? Okay. Yes, I'm doing a webinar right now. Thank you, I'm sorry. Um, I apologize for that. Um, so um, for our second question regarding whether distance from live trees influences regeneration in severely burned areas, um, you can see in the table to your left and in the regression curves to your right that within about 50 meters of surviving forest edges, um, seedling densities tend to be greater than about 50 stems per acre. But as distances increase 50 meters or more from surviving forest edges, seedling densities decrease with very few seedlings regenerating um, 250 meters from live seed sources. So we found an average of four stems per acre um, at 250 meters from live seed sources. Um, I do want to point out that this trend was not significant for Douglas fir. We actually did not find a lot of Douglas fir um, regeneration within high severity burn areas. For our third question regarding whether or not there were other abiotic or biotic factors that are influencing conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas, um, we found that we kind of threw a laundry list of um, factors into a multivariate analysis. And so those variables included distance from surviving forest, elevation, slope, aspect, um, pre-fire stand basal area, coarse wood, fine wood, understory vegetation, um, and those were all variables that were collected in the field. And then we derived some other information such as precipitation from PRISM data, soil productivity and um, soil drainage indexes, and then topographic wetness index and solar radiation to determine what the most important predictors um, were of conifer regeneration. We found that distance from surviving forest and elevation were the most important um, and significant um, uh, variables that we found. And using the same set of variables listed in the last slide, we also performed a regression tree analysis to try to ter determine the most important predictors of conifer regeneration, as well as some important ecological thresholds. And we found, again, that um, I'll try to walk this uh, through these figures for you. So again, we found that distance from surviving forest is the number one most important predictor of conifer regeneration within high severity burn areas. And that distances of um, greater than or equal to 50 meters from surviving forest edges, we had median um, regeneration densities of zero stems per acre. But within 50 meters of surviving forest edges, Elevation was the second most important predictor variable, where at elevations greater than about 8,200 feet, we had um, median regeneration densities of about 400 stems per acre. Um, these are all, all these numbers are for stems per hectare, um, but I kind of translated it for those of you who um, think in terms of acres. Um, and that at elevations lower than about 8,200 feet on the Colorado Front Range, um, we had predicted median regeneration densities of zero stems per acre. And these um, trends were really similar for ponderosa pine because ponderosa pine was our dominant um, conifer species that we found regenerating and accounted for the vast majority of the conifers um, that we sampled. So to summarize for the Colorado Front Range region, our results illustrate that post-fire regeneration um, is occurring within high severity burn patches of recent Colorado front range forests, um, I'm sorry, fires, but average regeneration densities are low. And it's uncertain whether this regeneration um, will be sufficient for forest recovery. So the regeneration densities that are occurring within these high severity burn patches, particularly in areas where surviving is not in forest is not in close proximity, are generally lower than both the National Forest Management Act and historical benchmarks in this region. 
Um, elevation was also seen to be an important predictor of conifer regeneration in high severity burn areas where higher elevations are positively correlated with increased conifer regeneration densities and very little regeneration has occurred at lower elevations. And so really I think that elevation can be used um, for a proxy for xericness here in the Colorado Front Range. Um, as higher elevations tend to be cooler and more mesic, while lower elevations tend to be hotter and receive less precipitation. And so I think these two photos illustrate this really nicely. Um, the photo on your left I took in the Bobcat Gulch Fire, which is near to Fort Collins, Colorado, where I'm speaking right now. And I took this photo about 25 meters from the forest edge, um, the surviving forest edge, at an elevation of about 8,200 feet. And so you can see lots of post-fire um, ponderosa pine regeneration within this plot, um, whereas in the exact same fire at 25 meters from forest edge, but um, surviving forest edge, but an elevation of about 5,800 feet, we had no regeneration occurring. And this was a trend that I saw um, quite frequently. So all of these results and more can be seen in um, this paper published in Forest Ecology and Management um, in 2016. And I'm happy to pass along a PDF if anybody um, is really interested in reading that. But now I'd like to share with you all our preliminary results for a study where we're examining tree regeneration within high severity burn areas within the larger Southern Rockies region, which includes the Black Hills. And so this is a photo that I took along this, a surviving forest edge in the Jasper Fire, um, which occurred in the Black Hills in the year 2000. And I think it nicely illustrates um, what we were seeing as far as kind of a band of regeneration occurring. I'll try to point this out with my mouse on the photo. A band of regeneration that occurs along the surviving forest edge but that really not a lot of regeneration is occurring out into the high severity burn area. And so this band illustrates the higher densities um, near forest edges um, that we were seeing. And we were interested in understanding whether the patterns of kind of regeneration um, that we were seeing on the front range of Colorado were the same across the larger Southern Rockies region. So similar to Colorado, wildfires have dramatically increased in size, frequency, and severity in the last um, several de few decades in the larger Southern Rockies region. And, um, so this map illustrates the large fires that have occurred in this region since 1990 that are greater than 1,000 um, hectares. So similar to Colorado, you can see some very large fires have burned in this region. Um, and a lot of those fires have burned with very large contiguous portions of um, high severity burn areas within those wildfires. So for this larger Southern Rockies region, which included the front range of Colorado, where we added some additional transects um, to the original study that I did for my master's work. And then we also um, sampled a fire in the Laramie Mountain Range in, in Wyoming. And then we sampled um, five additional fires in um, the Black Hills of South Dakota and Wyoming. Um, so we sampled a total of 11 fires um, within this larger Southern Rockies region. Again, all of the fires were required to be at least 10 years old or older, um, and all the fires had to be at, at least 1,000 um, hectares in size. And um, within these fires, across the larger Southern Rockies um, region, we have collected data along 98 transects and have a total of over 800 plots, 600 of which are within the high severity burn areas. And here's just a table of some of those fires. For those of you who may live in this region or know some of these fires, um, primarily most of these fires were on the Black Hills National Forest, the Pike National Forest, um, the Roosevelt National Forest, or um, the Medicine Bow National Forest. And so for our larger study area, our research er um, objectives were to characterize regeneration and regeneration growth within severely burned areas relative to areas that burn less severely or not at all. And then also to identify the direct and indirect effects of overstory conditions, local climatic conditions, and ground layer conditions on post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration using a structural equation modeling approach. And so uh, this is a little bit confusing, but I'm just gonna quickly walk you through our hypotheses. So this is a path diagram that is very common to use um, when one is using a structural equation modeling approach. 
And essentially, um, all of these arrows indicate our hypotheses. So our first hypothesis is that um, distance from surviving forests directly influences post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration within high severity burn areas. But that also for a second, second part of that hypothesis, we um, believe that distance from surviving forest edge may influence ground layer conditions such as combined graminoid and forb cover, shrub cover, um, other post-fire tree regeneration, so non-ponderosa pine species tree regeneration, and then um, coarse wood cover, and that those conditions may in turn influence post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration. For a second hypothesis, um, we predict that um, local climatic conditions, including 30-year normal climatic water deficit and 30-year normal actual evapotranspiration, um, will directly influence post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration. And I'll talk about these two variables a little bit more in just a moment. But our second part of that hypothesis is that these local climatic conditions will directly influence ground layer conditions, um, which will then indirectly impact um, post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration. And a third hypothesis is that ground layer conditions such as combined graminoid and forb cover shrub cover and coarse wood cover will all directly impact other post-fire tree regeneration. So again, non-ponderosa pine species. So for our results, this is a table reporting our average densities and stems per hectare for this, the various tree species that we found across the 11 wildfires. And so this is a ton of information in small text and numbers. Um, so I'm really just going to touch on some of these highlights, but I did want to provide this for you for those who want to Take a look at this later. Um, we did find that conifers comprise the majority of the post-fire tree regeneration within these study areas, and that of course ponderosa pine was the most common um, regenerating conifer um, that we found. So the other conifer species that we found were Douglas fir, Rocky Mountain juniper, lodgepole pine, and white spruce. Um, but none of those species were very abundant within high severity burn areas. Um, deciduous species such as aspen, paper birch, um, and burr and gamble oak were numerically abundant but were concentrated in only a small subset of plots. And aspen was the most dominant of the deciduous um, species regenerating following fire and accounted for 26% of all the post-fire tree, um, uh, trees regenerating that we found. So because ponderosa pine is the dominant species in the post-fire forest that we were studying, um, and we're also the most abundant um, regenerating tree species we found, we focused our remaining analyses on, post, uh, on ponderosa pine regeneration. So that we, we found that ponderosa pine regeneration densities were strongly negatively impacted by increasing fire severity. And so I'll just walk through this, um, this figure for you. So U indicates unburned plots, low indicates low to moderate severity burn plots, and then H with a dash indicates all of our high severity burn plots. Um, and then the number is correlated with the um, distance from surviving forests. So it sort of reflects this, um, this image that I, I showed you all later. Um, so within our unburned plots, we saw a median, I'm sorry, a mean of 380 stems per acre. Whereas in our low to moderate severity burn plots, we had an average of about 140 stems per acre. And then plots within our high severity burn areas that were um, between the surviving forest and up to 75 meters from surviving forest edge um, had a mean regeneration density of approximately 68 stems per acre. Whereas plots that were greater than 100 meters from surviving forest edges had median regeneration densities of 11 stems per, per acre. And notably, um, all of our plots that were greater than 25 meters from surviving forest edges had a median regeneration density of zero. And in contrast to density, both the height and annual growth of post-fire regenerating ponderosa pine were positively influenced by increasing fire severity. So regenerating ponderosa pine across unburned and low to moderate severity burn plots were on average about 38 um, centimeters tall on average and put on about um, 
three centimeters growth annually um, during the three years um, prior to our measurements. Um, whereas in our post, for, whereas in our high severity burn plots, um, post fire ponderosa pine regeneration was on average 57 centimeters tall on average and grew an um, average of five centimeters annually. Um, but within high severity burn areas, we observe differences in post fire ponderosa pine regeneration heights and height growth. So for example, at 25 meters from surviving forest edges, ponderosa pine seedlings were about 70 centimeters tall on average and grew an average of 70, I'm sorry, seven centimeters annually. Um, whereas 100 meters from surviving forest edges, regenerating ponderosa pine were um, 51 centimeters tall on average and grew an average of six centimeters um, annually. And then at 250 meters from surviving forest edges um, within high severity burn areas, regenerating ponderosa pine were 38 centimeters tall on average and grew an average of about two centimeters um, annually. So we're seeing decreasing regeneration height and height growth as distance from surviving forest edges increase, which may be that the seedlings that are getting out into these high severity burn areas more than 100 meters from surviving forest edges are just dealing with harsher conditions and can't grow quite as tall. But it may also be that the, the seedlings that are getting out there are um, simply younger. And we did not actually destructively sample any seedlings. So we don't know the exact ages, but we did do world counting, which has been shown um, to illustrate um, within a couple of years the, the average ages. I do also want to point out here that our plots at 75 meters from surviving forest edges had much taller um, regeneration heights and also regeneration height growth. And that was because we only added these plots in our second year of data collection. And so we have a lower sample size, which brings that um, mean, uh, mean and median up. Um, so to examine the direct and indirect effects um, on post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration, we used a structural equation model. And so I recognize that looking at this figure can look like a crazy spider web or basket weaving at first, um, but I'm gonna try to walk you through this quickly. Um, so red lines here indicate um, negative associations, whereas black lines indicate positive associations. And our line thickness is proportional to um, each path coefficient, and that number or that value is um, reported next to the line. And so what that means is just the weight of that relationship. Um, we also have varying levels of significance denoted by asterisks um, next to these, and so many of these do not have an asterisk. Um, those were um, uh, areas where um, the p-values for the results were larger than um, 0.1. And then all the other p-values are um, listed down here in this figure description. But for now, I won't really focus on that. Um, what I do want to illustrate for you is that we found that across the Southern Rockies region within um, high severity burn areas, Distance from surviving forest was the most significant predictor of post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration. Um, and that um, these regeneration densities were negatively correlated with increasing distance from surviving forest edges, similar to the figure um, that I just talked about a couple of minutes ago. We also found that 30-year um, normal climatic water deficit um, was negatively influencing post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration and that higher values of climatic water deficit resulted in decreased um, regeneration densities. Um, we found that 30-year normal actual evapotranspiration was positively associated with post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration, as was coarse wood cover. Um, and then finally, um, we found that 30-year normal climatic water deficit was also negatively influencing the presence of other post-fire tree regeneration. So again, these were um, all non-ponderosa pine species that we sampled within high severity burn areas. So just to kind of um, delve into some of these relationships in more detail, um, the figure here on the um, x-axis is 30-year normal climatic water deficit. 
And on the y-axis, we have regeneration densities in stems per hectare. Um, and then these points are observation points. And so the green um, points are those from the Black Hills fires. Blue points are those from the Colorado Front Range fires. And then red points are from the Laramie um, Mountain Range fire. And so 30-year um, norm, I'm sorry, 30-year normal climatic water deficit which is calculated as the difference between potential evapotranspiration and actual transpiration, and can be considered really a metric of water stress, was obviously very negatively correlated um, with post-fire ponderous pine regeneration densities. So areas where we had higher climatic water deficit values um, tended to be hotter and drier um, than areas that had lower um, climatic water deficit values. And that's where we are seeing um, declines in regeneration densities. And then um, for this figure, um, on the x-axis, we have actual evapotranspiration, and on the y-axis, regeneration densities again. Um, and then the same denotations for um, observation points. So actual evapotranspiration, what represents the simultaneous availability of water and energy and really is associated with plant productivity, is positively associated with post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration. So areas that had higher um, values of actual evapotranspiration really can be kind of considered wetter areas, and that's where we are seeing increased regeneration densities, such as in this photo here um, in the Buffalo Creek Fire in Colorado. Um, where we um, observed some pretty high um, values for actual evapotranspiration. And then coarse wood cover, which is here on the x-axis in this figure, and then um, on the y-axis again, we have regeneration density. Um, coarse, wood recover, coarse wood cover, which represents fallen dead wood that was previously um, uh, ponderosa pine um, dominated forests that were burned in the fire and then um, died and have fallen over um, in the years since the fire occurred. Um, that dead wood is greater than or equal to 7.6 centimeters in diameter, was positively associated with post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration densities. And so I think this is interesting because it um, may be indicating that the complex um, structure of the fallen dead wood may create um, microsites that um, are facilitating establishing seedlings um, and, and are protecting them from solar or wind radiation. So all of these results indicate that ponderosa pine regeneration in high severity burn areas is not only influenced by the presence and proximity to surviving forests, but also the harshness of potential germination sites following high severity wildfire. Um, and our preliminary results across the Southern Rockies indicate that regeneration is occurring in high severity burn areas, but at low densities. Um, and that we're seeing very little regeneration occurring 100 meters or more from surviving forest edges due to the fact that increased distance from surviving forest is resulting in decreased post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration. And our findings of distance from surviving forest edge negatively influencing post-fire regeneration is similar to findings from other studies across the distribution of ponderosa pine. And then other site factors are influencing post-fire ponderosa pine regeneration across the Southern Rockies region. And our um, results illustrate that climatic water deficit, actual evapotranspiration, and coarse wood cover are influencing ponderosa pine regeneration within severely burned areas. So our findings and that of several other studies across the distribution of ponderosa pine within high severity burn areas indicate that the resiliency of ponderosa pine forests following large high severity wildfires is limited by distance to surviving seed sources, but also by the harsh conditions um, due to a lack of overstory trees. And I can attest to um, how harsh these conditions are just from walking around in areas like this. Um, over several years. It is very hot and very dry. And I also believe that the size and shape of high severity burn patches is going to strongly influence forest recovery in these areas. So my co-author, Sparkle Malone, um, who is a professor at the Florida International University now, has developed some spatial analyses of Southern Rockies fires um, where she's examined 
high severity burn patches, and then their distances to surviving forest edges. So in this figure, um, yellow or orange indicates areas that are within about 100 meters of surviving forest edges, um, but areas that are red are areas that are greater than 200 meters from um, surviving forest edges. Um, so fires such as the Jasper fire or the Hayman fire that are very, very large fires and also have very large contiguous areas of surviving um, of uh, high severity burn within these fires um, may, um, may not recover very quickly. Whereas um, fires such as the Grizzly Gulch fire where the vast majority of that fire is within about 100 meters of surviving forest edges um, may recover relatively quickly um, following fire. And the regeneration that's occurring within these areas um, will take decades to reach reproductive maturity, um, prolonging natural recovery of these forests. So here, Sparkle has developed a recovery model with the assumption that ponderosa pine will require at least 60 years to reach reproductive maturity um, in the Southern Rockies region. And um, so in, the, in these fires, um, she's predicting that areas in gray um, will recover within about 200 years of surviving forests. Areas in blue um, will recover within approximately 400 years of, um, of uh, wildfire. And then areas that are in green or yellow may take up to 800 years um, to recover following these high severity wildfire events. And then within the Hayman fire, um, there is one very large contiguous high severity burn patch um, where Sparkle is predicting that um, it may take up to a thousand years um, for that area to recover to a forested condition. And so these are models and just predictions. Um, Oh, excuse me. Um, and our findings are also only for just a brief snapshot in time. So regeneration events will continue to establish and regeneration will continue to die. So masting events occur every four to six years in this region. However, the right climatic conditions necessary for an actual establishment event um, need to occur. And that those two things aligning only occur every approximately six to 20 years in this region. And once termination does occur, seedling mortality tends to be very high. So this is a figure done um, by Wayne Shepherd and others um, here on the Colorado Front Range where they examined natural ponderosa pine regeneration, uh, I'm sorry, germination and survival. And they found a really um, large amount of mortality within the first four years um, and attribute much of the germination survival that they did see um, to the presence of overstory trees within their study. And overstory trees are obviously absent from high severity burn areas, so there's a lot of unknowns moving forward um, with how these, for these forests within high severity burn areas will naturally regenerate. Additionally, projected future changes in temperature and drought may restrict dryland forest regeneration. So this is a um, figure from a recent um, paper by Petri et al. in Ecology. Um, and they predicted um, ponderosa pine regeneration potential envelopes um, over the next 80 years. And their predictions are illustrating that within the Southern Rockies region, um, regeneration potential is going to decline pretty dramatically for ponderosa pine. And then it's also important to consider the potential for these high severity burn areas um, to reburn again into the future. So this photo is um, from a uh, fire in the Black Hills. And here's some ponderosa pine that's kind of hiding in and amongst the um, coarse dead wood and also the standing dead wood um, in this high severity burn area. And um, this area received fire um, again several years later. <clears throat> and of course, all of that regeneration um, experienced mortality. So these findings have important implications um, for managers in terms of long-term forest regeneration and resiliency. So uncertainties such as future regeneration events, high mortality rates, and then predicted declines in regeneration due to changes in future temperature and drought make management recommendations or predictions challenging without longer-term research. 
But if a forested condition is desired in the nearer term, planting should be aimed at distances that are greater than 100 meters from surviving forest edges, and preferably within the middle of these high severity burn areas where possible, as natural regeneration may be prolonged due to this relationship with distance from surviving forest edge. So with that, I, I think I'm probably close to being out of time and I'd love to um, leave some time for questions. So there's many people to thank for assistance with these two projects. Um, funding was provided by the National Forest Plan. And then my email is provided here for any of those who would like to contact me personally um, regarding any questions. So thank you again so much for taking um, some time out of your day to learn about this research. And I'll pass this back over to Gloria um, to address some of the questions that have been answered over the hour. So thanks again, everyone. Gloria, can you hear me? You, you wanna unmute yourself, uh, Gloria, lower left-hand corner. Okay, folks. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, Marin, we have two questions at this point. One is, uh, what is recovery defined as in the uh, Sparkle Malone spatial analysis? What, is she, what do you think she means by recovery? What she means is she's essentially growing, let me go back to that slide. What she means is she's trying to grow um, the forest back out to um, historical densities. And so um, she's got um, the establishment, the, the, so for example, trees, I'm gonna use this as a, um, an area. So everything in white here is surviving forest. So some trees here are gonna get out into the high severity burn area. Um, they're gonna regenerate, they're going to grow to um, the age of sexual reproduction, which we have to estimate as 60 years because that's the best that we could find in the literature. And then those trees will continue to grow up, spread their seeds, um, and then that will continue to be kind of a slow forward moving march into the middle of these high severity burn areas. Um, and there is a density component in there, and I'm not exactly sure what that exact number is, but in conversations that I've had with her, that was to historical density information that we have um, here from the Colorado Front Range and then also from the Black Hills. Does that answer that question? Um, I'm hoping so. Um, okay. Jessica, if uh, you have more questions, just go ahead and post. Oh, she says yes, thank you. Thank and you. We had a previous Great question. <laughs> Great. Uh, we had a previous question at the beginning. Uh, you, you report that conifers don't reestablish well. The farther from the surviving forest edges one gets. How successful is regeneration of native non-conifers such as grasses, sagebrush, et cetera, in areas where conifers don't regenerate. And you covered that a little bit. Um. Yeah, um, I have a slide here actually. So I had the fortune of being a botany technician and doing the 10 year post fire um, botany work in the Hayman fire. And so what, I, I, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly, but here's just an example of what these burned areas look like um, within the Hayman fire. So at least in the Colorado Front Range, um, which is a little bit different than the Black Hills, um, we're definitely seeing a forb and grass dominated um, understory vegetation um, coming back. And so here's another photo that I think well illustrates that. Um, and there's also some uh, aspen here in the background. Um, we do have some short statured shrubs here on the Colorado Front Range and also in the Black Hills. And those species are um, uh, shrubs such as ribes, um, uh, mountain mahogany, um, Arctostaphylus uva ursi. Um, so really short statured shrubs that don't tend to um, outcompete um, tree species such as conifer species um, as they do in other areas of ponderous pines distribution particularly um, like in California. Um, so what we sort of saw overall is that we're seeing great um, understory regeneration in the majority of these areas because they're no longer competing with ponderosa pine um, for 
sun and for water and other nutrients. Okay, great answer. Um, all right, we have a few more coming in. Um, Mark Williams has asked, most of the research from CSU and um, CU Boulder, uh, for example, Tom Veblen's work, demonstrates that higher elevation ponderosa pine forests burned almost entirely with moderate to high severity fire. There's less evidence about high severity patch size. However, historical photos from these areas seem to show large areas were sparsely forested. Given these sources of evidence, of fo uh, photos, um, would, wouldn't you say your patch, patches of high severity fire are just part of the variability in tree density as they seem to be within the range of historical variability? Also, wouldn't these low density patches be more resilient to future drier conditions? So two basic questions. Do you think, uh, based on historical photos, where areas were sparsely forested, that would you say your patches of high severity fire are just part of historical variability? Yeah, and I apologize. I keep getting a sign that my inter internet connection is unstable. So you kind of broke up. Can you repeat that last simplified question? Okay, yeah, and the, and the last question is, so are the patches of high severity fire just part of the variability in tree density within historical range of variability? Mm -hmm. And with these low density patches that are uh, regenerating, aren't they gonna be more resilient to future drier conditions? Yeah, um, so if I understand the question correctly, um, I think that's a really good question. And I think that there is still some t scientific debate about whether or not these very large high severity burn patches are um, considered unprecedented. Um, and I think that there is some evidence that's come particularly out of Tom Veblen's lab and some others across um, the distribution of ponderosa pine here in the West that's, that really do call that into question. And, um, and I think that's totally valid. Um, I think that there's also um, not pictures of forests that look like, um, you know, I'm just showing you an aerial imagery, um, image of the Hayman fire and then the Buffalo Creek fire and another fire here. Um, they, these are all in the front range of Colorado. Um, we, to my understanding, and I'm not a dendrochronologist, um, that is not my area of expertise, we, we have not been able to illustrate areas where we see very large um, areas that burned at high severity over very large landscapes like this. Um, and there's just not evidence of it. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, um, but we're not seeing that dendrochronological um, evidence on the ground. So I do think that there's still some questions to be answered there. Um, and unfortunately, I do not have the best answer for that yet. But We'll keep working on it. Okay. Um, James Canaveri asked, were there any significant abundances of shrubby or invasive regeneration within the plots, close to or within the severely burned areas? He's wondering if the small amount of regeneration which is occurring close to the forest edge will eventually feather itself out over time to fill the gap. Do you think it's possible before shrub fills the void or another fire or does soil erosion from heavy rains occur? And he has another question, but we'll, we'll go with that one first. Sure. Um, so again, we're, we're not seeing a ton of competition with understory vegetation or shrubs. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to some of these photos here along surviving forest edges. Um, I think that some of these areas are so large that um, feathering in will eventually happen, it just may take a very, very long time. And then there is the question of whether or not at that point, understory vegetation, such as grasses, forbs, and shrubs, are so well established that they will outcompete ponderosa pine. And that's again where I think that there's just a lot of unknowns with such large high severity burn areas um, that we, we just haven't seen in, the, in you know, our recent um, decades um, or in or also that we don't have great evidence for in um, historical record 
that we're really just not sure how that's going to um, pan out. But I don't believe, at least in this area, um, that shrubs are really out-competing um, ponderosa pine, at least at this point. I don't think that's the reason why we're not seeing um, regeneration. And that's actually um, in the first study on the Colorado Front Range, that was one of the factors, was whether or not we um, the cover of grasses, forbs, um, or shrubs um, were a a prominent influence on um, regeneration. Um, and so we ended up actually inevitably kind of combining all of those things um, into just understory vegetation generally, but we examined um, grasses, forbs, and shrub cover individually. And the only time that we found that it was significant was for Douglas fir regeneration. And I think that's because Douglas fir is really a shade intolerant, um, a shade tolerant species and really requires some kind of protection. And so perhaps grass or um, shrubs nearby was helping to um, uh, ease Douglas fir from some of the harsh conditions out in these high severity burn areas. Um, is there any sort of insect problems with ponderosa pine? Uh, what does it mean for ponderosa pine and Douglas fir as well with fire involved long in heat and dryness? I like the idea of reforesting islands of seedlings to add some future reforesting trees. Yeah, so. okay, so that was a three-part question, the first being are there yeah. any insect issues? Um, this, this might be from somebody uh, out of state or not familiar with uh, insect issues, so are there any sort of insect problems with ponderosa pine? Um, there are, we have mountain pine beetle here. Um, and that has influenced some ponderosa pine here on the front range of Colorado. Um, but that has not been a big um, combined disturbance in, um, in this area yet. What was the second part of the question? Yeah, what does it mean for ponderosa pine and Douglas fir with fire involved along the heat and dryness? I, I'm assuming um, James means... Uh, how much impact does uh, increased heat and fire and dryness have on those two species? Um, in terms of their mortality or? I would suppose so. Okay. Um, they, they, uh, if I understand the, the question correctly, um, ponderosa pine is a really fire adapted species. Um, it has really thick bark. Its branches, um, it drops its lower branches as it ages so that um, it does not encourage fire to move up into its crown. Um, and then it also, um, it, it just has a lot of different um, fire tolerant characteristics. Whereas Douglas fir does not have as strong a fire tolerance um, in its just growth characteristics. Um, Douglas fir tends to be more of a triangular shape and so it does allow for um, surface fire that's moving along the ground to more easily get up into the high into the crown. Um, and so for those two reasons, um, uh, ponderosa pine can survive a low to moderate severity fire a little bit more easily than Douglas fir can. Um, but within these high severity burn areas, um, it seemed like many of those were um, very dry conditions, and then we had some really extreme wind events and their, um, the, the potential for crown fire was just so high that neither species really could um, survive those conditions. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, we only have a few more minutes. Uh, do invasive species have any impacts on regeneration? And Marin, go, you go ahead and answer that. Just I uh, want to let everyone know I'm going to launch a, a poll now. So while you're listening to Marin's response there, if you don't mind, uh, just sort of log. Uh, your response in this poll and just give us a little feedback on how, how we're doing. Go ahead, Mary. Sure. Um, so I can speak at least, you know, from a botanical perspective, um, from doing the, the post-fire, um, the 10-year post-fire botany work in the Hayman, we did find some um, uh, invasive species in the first three years following the fire. But after 10 years, it seemed like the native species really had rebounded and that many of those invasive species were annuals that just kind of died off after the first few um, years. And so from my observations actually walking around in um, these 11 fires over a few years is that 
there's small pockets of issues of um, invasive species. The most common ones that I saw were um, things like um, toad flax um, and then a small bit of cheatgrass. But the, the, these fires do not have the same kind of issues with invasive species, particularly cheatgrass, that we're seeing in other areas of the country, um, such as California. So I actually don't think that that's a huge impact on regeneration, um, and we really just didn't see a ton of um, issues with invasive species generally. Great, thanks. Uh, there's one other, uh, two more questions if we can fit them in. Are managers in your area considering planting other species, such as pinion pine, on harsher, lower elevation sites that previously supported ponderosa? Why or why not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah. uh, I can really speak to the planting that has occurred on um, the, the Pike National Forest here in um, Colorado. Um, and then I know for South Dakota, um, in the Black Hills, that really they're focusing on ponderosa pine um, if they do any planting. And that's really the same here in Colorado. They're primarily planting ponderosa pine, um, but I think that there would be a lot of really interesting um, examinations about what species do survive within these high severity burn areas. I don't know of any um, major planting efforts of other species, um, such as um, pinion or juniper, um, but I think that that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Um, regarding transect locations, this is the last question, I believe. Uh, oh, no, wait, there's more. Uh, we may have to go ahead and just do the best we can. Uh, we, we're just about out of time. Regarding transect locations, how, pot how were potential topographic or weather factors addressed regarding possible seed shadows? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the, the restrictions that I had on my um, transects were pretty extreme, actually. I needed, um, I'm going to go back to um, this figure. So I had to have a um, high severity burn area that was at least um, 300 meters wide and had no surviving trees within it. Um, and so that actually was quite difficult to, um, that wasn't quite difficult, but it was challenging to find that as well as a low to moderate severity burn area that was as wide as our study area required, which was at least 100 meters. And so as far as topography, we did have some kind of safety um, regulations as far as not working on slopes um, over the entire transect that were more than, I believe, 60 degrees, um, which is pretty steep. And then also um, the access into a lot of these areas was somewhat difficult. And if anybody has ever walked around in high severity burn areas like this, um, you're really walking over a lot of pretty dangerous material. Um, I think some of this illustrates that. So getting out into these high severity burn areas um, was a little bit of a challenge just logistically. Um, and then also many of these areas experiencing um, high rates of um, uh, lightning. And so we, we had some constriction on how far we could be from our vehicles just for safety reasons. Um, but generally, I wish I had a better map for you. These were kind of spread sort of all over wherever we found the largest high severity burn patches that we could find. Does that answer that question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Um, what do you think, Mark? Can we keep going a few, few more minutes? Uh, let's just take another question or two. I've actually got another. Uh meeting okay. after this one. So let's just do maybe one or two and then we can wrap it up if you don't mind. Okay, I'm going to go for the um, the most general uh, futuristic sort of question here. Your research seems to indicate high severity fire results in regeneration well below restocking standards and has implication measured in centuries. Is there any management activities that could reduce the severity of wildfires when they occur? Yeah, that's a great question. The severity of wildfires? Of course. Is there any activities that could reduce the severity of wildfires when they occur? Yeah. So well, I'd love to talk about that too, but it's your webinar. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of, um, of things that we can do um, to reduce the homogeneity of these forests and then also try to restore stand structure and competition to, uh, composition to these forests. 
So um, that's commonly referred to as forest restoration here um, in the Southern Rockies region. And I can speak to you the, that there's really a lot of work um, going on to try to get this going on on a large landscape here on the Front Range of Colorado where I live. Um, and I do understand that there's a lot of effort for that um, in the Black Hills as well. And so there's, um, you know, there's definitely been case studies where they've shown that um, under certain fire events, um, that, that those efforts to restore um, the kinds of densities as well as species composition that we saw um, historically um, prior to fire suppression, that, um, that that can actually reduce the risk of crown fire um, pretty well. That all depends on the actual fire um, conditions and we're seeing that um, very high wind events um, don't, the, the forest restoration may or may not help that. But in general, I think that it's commonly thought that forest restoration can dramatically reduce the risk of um, high sturdy wildfire. Wonderful, Marin. Thank you so much. Thank um, you all. Uh, just a little, a quick note. I uh, would like to thank all the people who made this possible. I don't know if we have a final slide. Dun, 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 dun. Um, Southern Rockies Fire Science Network helped to facilitate and get the word out about the um, um, this webinar. And we are a regional representation chapter of the Joint Fire Science Program. If you'd like to find out more, visit our website, southernrockiesfirescience.org. And um, please let me know if you have any questions. I've also posted the email for Megan Detmeyer. Uh, there is the link for CEU credits. And thanks very much to Marin for this wonderful research. This is really amazing stuff. Um, I hope it has a lot of implications for management decisions and reforestation in the future. Thank you very much for attending. And please look for more Utah State University and Southern Rockies Network webinars in the future. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, folks. See ya. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.